Thank you for taking the time to view this message online. You can connect with us more through our comments section of this video, through our Facebook page, or through our website, nhgj.org. We've spent the past few months looking at this idea of growing deep in our discipleship. Uh, in this series, we've looked at five core areas that really help to shape our church culture, the culture of New Horizons. When I use the word culture, it's really the environment in which uh, things grow or things happen. Uh, I'm talking about how we function as a church, the common assumption or values that we work together with. We think about culture oftentimes in terms of nations, and certainly nations around the world have different cultures. Uh, even in the United States, different regions have cultures. Uh, the South is different from the Northeast, is different from the Pacific Northwest, uh, different from the Southwest. And so we, we see that. We see the way that people interact is different, and the, the social norms are different in the culture. Even cities in the same state have different cultures. Grand Junction's culture is different than Alamosa, is different than Greeley, and of course, all of these are different than Boulder. It's its own republic in itself, we say in Colorado. Uh, but even families have cultures. The culture of one family and the way that they interact with one another and the, the norms of what's acceptable or, or unacceptable change from family to family, their own family culture. And lastly, this is where we're kind of zeroing in, is that churches have cultures. And in our church culture, what we're looking at or what we're trying to develop together is an environment or a culture that supports or lifts up spiritual maturity. It nurtures this idea of growing deep spiritually. And so here I, I, we're providing, uh, I'm going to provide for you a list of these five core areas that we've been looking at on our spiritual journey. So the first one, uh, we focused on this idea of growing deep beneath the surface. And in this idea, we said, listen, our life flows out of what's beneath the surface, not just all the externals that are taking place around us. That we have to nurture this deep life where we're being transformed from the inside out. And so that's beneath the surface discipleship. We don't want to be a church that just applies rules and regulations and tells people how they're supposed to live and say, there, we fixed it. Everybody's a disciple now. We want to take a different approach. We want people to be introspective. We want them to be yielding to the Holy Spirit's work and transformed internally dealing with their past, dealing with hidden things, dealing with life on the inside so that they can be transformed on the outside as well. Next, we looked at the invitation to live a slowed down spirituality. Boy, if we've ever experienced slowed down spirituality, or at least the opportunity for it, it's been during the uh, pandemic that we've seen in the early part of 2020. And the reason is, is because we were told that we had to, or we were mandated to, uh, remain in our homes and slow down our lives. A lot of events that we were used to were canceled, and, and even church services. We moved to online for a good portion, and that'll begin to change uh, in the near future. But for right now, we, we've seen how our lives have been kind of forced into this uh, culture where things have slowed down. Now, whether or not we slowed down spiritually, that's a whole nother matter. Whether or not we took the time during this slow down time to actually spend time with the Lord, that's really our goal. When we talk about slow down spirituality, we're saying we need to put in, 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 uh, in step or in practice this lifestyle that gives us time to be with Jesus. We can't be busy doing things for Jesus unless we've spent time with Jesus. Another way to look at it is our life for him can't outpace or outrun our time with him. And so that's slow down spirituality. Third, our focus was about having a church that is intent on healthy community. And that idea comes from this, this value or this decision that we need the whole body of Christ. That it's not just the body of Christ shouldn't just be a multiple expressions of me and what I like but that it should be more diverse than that. And so I contribute to the health and the diversity within the body of Christ when I listen more than I talk and I make room for differences instead of bristling against them and trying to push them away from me. So that's that healthy community recognizing that the body of Christ is a diverse body. Uh, fourthly, uh, 
we took time to focus on passionate marriage and singleness. And the core idea of this is that God wants to minister or his calling in your life, he wants to minister through marriage or through singleness, not in spite of it. That those are his gifts into your life and those core relationships are where he does so much of his discipling work. At times people feel like, well, because I'm married or because I'm single, I've, God's gonna have to do something in spite of that. And again, our reinforcement, our message, and the culture that we're developing is that these are core relationships, marriage and singleness. And out of those core relationships, God is going to use you and his calling recognizes that those are aspects of your life through which he wants to minister. Now, over the past few weeks, we've been looking at this idea of being a kingdom of priests. And it's been addressing this idea that if we're going to mature in Christ, if we're going to grow deeper in him, if our church culture is going to support this maturity that we want to see, then it, when it comes down to ministry, we can't divide out between uh, clergy and laity. Uh, there can't be pastor and parishioners, but instead recognizing that all followers of Jesus are called into ministry not as a vocation, and that's where the difference comes, because when people think of calling and being in ministry, oftentimes the idea of a vocational ministry comes into play. That's not what I'm talking about. What the emphasis here is that a healthy church culture that is growing deep is one that recognizes that we're all called to be ministers in his kingdom. We're all priests in his kingdom. And so this is part of our discipleship. On this last idea, one, one uh, scripture that supports this, there's many, but this one that we've been focusing on is out of 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Now, we're going to return to this idea during this message, and uh, we're going to turn to the book of Mark chapter 6, and we're going to look at Jesus' sending out of the 12 disciples as kind of the context for this idea that we're all called and that we're all ministers in his kingdom. So before we get to there, let's, uh, let's have a word of prayer as we invite the Holy Spirit to lead our time together. We do welcome you, Holy Spirit. We settle our thoughts and we surrender them before you. We invite you to speak to us through the word of God we invite you to quicken us to hear what you have to say to us. And we just want to say we're listening. Come Holy Spirit in great measure and allow us to hear you and to follow you as you help us to understand what it means to be a minister and a priest in your kingdom. Thank you for this time. We, we bless you. We bless your word. And may it come alive in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Mark 6, verses 7 through 13. I'm reading for the, from the English Standard Version. And he, Jesus, called the twelve and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He charged them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not put on two tunics. And he said to them, wherever you enter a house, stay there until you depart from there. If any place will not receive you and they will not listen to you, when you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that people should repent. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and they healed them. I'm going to get really direct on right to the point on this one. The main idea that I want to highlight uh, about Jesus is sending out of the 12 and that I think is important for our understanding, and it connects back to us, it comes in verse 7. It says, He called them and sent them now two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. Here's, here's the first and maybe the biggest thing I want to highlight and allow it to get into our spirit today, is that we need to have it fixed in our minds that ministry is not based on our worthiness but on Jesus Christ's calling and authority. Let me read that again. 
We need to have it fixed in our minds that ministry is not based on our worthiness, but on Jesus Christ's calling and authority. Now, this is such an important concept, such an important truth that we need to have anchored in our soul. There are many things to our advantage uh, as we think about being a believer in Christ here in uh, 2020, the year 2020. Uh, we have so much history behind us, uh, church history. We have the, even just the scriptures themselves unfolded before us, but so much history of uh, ministry in the church and God's work throughout the ages. So that helps us because we see patterns and we see the, the way that God has worked in the past. But there is one disadvantage that we experience from being so far removed from uh, the early church and specifically the 12 disciples, one thing that is to our disadvantage is that we have a tendency, human nature, we have this tendency to glamorize the past. We make it into something that it really isn't. Now, let me just kind of paint a picture of this just from my own experience, that when I was a kid, I used to buy candy. One of the things that I enjoyed so much, I would buy candy for 10 or 15 cents. For, uh, for a candy bar. Uh, in fact, I, one of my favorites was the Charleston Chew. The thing was a foot long, it was huge, and I just thought, man, I'm gonna get the most for my, my 15 cents. I'm gonna get this huge Charleston Chew and, and uh, just really invest well my candy money. Well, the thing about that is that the 15 cents uh, around my house and, and back in the day, we sometimes say that, there wasn't just quarter dimes and quarters laying around like there are at my house now. It was pennies. So to get to that 15 cents, I had to search a long time for pennies and gathering up pennies to get to that 15 cents so I could buy that candy bar. So what I normally would tell you if I want to glamorize the past is that, wow, candy's almost a buck now or 75 cents. When I was a kid, it was only 15 cents. What I may not tell you is that it took me a week to gather up enough pennies to be able to get that 15 cents. Similarly, uh, if I was to say that we didn't have as many allergies when I was growing up, you know, there is just so many allergies and, and it just seems like more people are, are sick now. So I might say that and I might have that perception, but what I won't tell you is that we used baby oil for sun coverage when we went out and suntan lotion, uh, no coverage whatsoever. In fact, uh, most of the sun screen, if you want to call it that, was a number two or a number 10. There was no such thing as a 50. And uh, in, in my household, and I grew up with my mom and stepfather, and they were both uh, active uh, smokers. And so they burned cigarettes like it was incense. But not only them, you'd go into the workplace and cigarettes filled the offices. Uh, you'd go on the plane, airplane. There was a smoking section on the airplane, smoking section in buses, smoking section in restaurants. And that's not in the too uh, distant past. Uh, when the foods that we ate, you know, involved usually a bunch of fat and a stick of butter and, and that kind of a lot of salt and that just cured it all. So I paint this picture because while I may glamorize and say, where are all these allergies? We were never this sick when I was younger. The truth is we had a lot of skin and lung cancer and we had heart disease at alarming rates. See, the tendency is to glamorize the past. It was this and it was so much better without seeing that there was a number of underlying issues back in the past uh, as well. And so here's, yeah, don't even get me started about athletes and comparing them from one generation or one era to another. We glamorize again what we knew and not necessarily what we experience now. So here's the tie back. Let me get back to the scriptures. Here's the challenge for us as we read this passage about the 12 apostles. The tendency we can have is to say, well, sure, back in the day with the 12 apostles, it makes sense that they were ministers and that they were being sent out. It makes sense because they walked with Jesus. They were something special. I am not something special. Were they? Were they something really that special? Let me highlight a couple things about these special apostles. They were special because Jesus called them, not because there was anything intrinsically within them. 
Was Peter really that special? Here's the guy who cut off the high priest's ear as Jesus was being taken or being prepared to be taken to the cross. And then a short time after that, he deserts Jesus. I don't think that's something special. In fact, many of us could identify with that and say, yeah, that might be something I would do. How about Thomas? After Jesus' resurrection, he won't even take the word of the other disciples. Here, all of his friends are testifying to him. He didn't even believe the words because Jesus encouraged them. I'm going to resurrect. He told them in different ways. And now Thomas, gathered in the upper room with the other disciples, he can't believe it. He says, unless I see where the nail holes went into his hands and I touch the side where they pierced his side, he says, I'm not going to believe it. And so Jesus shows up to him. I don't mean to pick on Thomas, but Thomas was one of those disciples that we would say, these guys are special. I'm not like Thomas. Many of us have had doubts, and so we're a lot like Thomas. How about this one? How about Judas, who before Jesus even makes it to the cross, Judas has hung himself out of guilt, having betrayed him and the other Jesus and the other disciples. Can we see ourselves that these guys, they're special because Jesus called them, not because there was something specifically special about them. In our mind, though, we say, oh, these are the icons of spirituality. These early men, these disciples, I, I could never match them because, uh, you know, they were so special in what they did. What made the disciples special is the same thing that makes you and I special. Jesus authorized them and empowered them to bring the kingdom of God. Now, when Jesus sent them out, in this passage in Mark 6, they weren't refined. They weren't somehow had passed through some type of Bible school or uh, had years of discipleship and, and growth under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. These were still young followers, young disciples. And yet, Jesus empowers them, authorizes them to bring the message of the kingdom of God. So the same is true for you, the same is true for myself that what is special about us is that Jesus calls us and that it's him who empowers us. Jesus is not waiting for you and I to get to a point of great spiritual maturity before he authorizes us to be priests in his kingdom, before he calls us to be ministers in his kingdom. He brings us to this point where when he calls us, he authorizes us. If you have said yes, to be a follower of Jesus, a disciple, then he is calling you and empowering you to bring his kingdom to the world. It's not qualified. It's, it's not that you have to be along in a certain point. When he calls us, he authorizes us and we become priests and ministers in his kingdom. So how does this happen? I wanna highlight again, just a couple things so that we're on the same page in terms of how do I bring the kingdom? How do you bring the kingdom of God to those around you? The first thing that I want to highlight is that you and I need to recognize that you have a calling to bring the kingdom. This calling is for all who follow Jesus. It's not just a select few. Just as Jesus called millions before you, he is calling you. Just as Jesus has empowered millions of other disciples, he is empowering you. It's not a vocation. And this is where oftentimes we get it mixed up in the church. When we think of calling, we think of vocational ministry. When I talk about everyone being a priest or a minister, we tend to think of somebody like myself who is a vocational pastor. We think of people who work as staff at a church building. But this is not the context. That idea is not where Jesus places this idea of uh, it calling and empowering. Every follower of Jesus is called to him and empowered by him to be a messenger for the kingdom. There are some who have a specific direction or calling to minister within the body of Christ. Pastors, prophets, teachers. He's called many people with different giftings. And unfortunately, in church, different cultures around the world and in, in church culture and different modern and different eras, uh, in our modern era, we highlight the role of pastor and they tend to have the one lens through which we see everything. 
And so it skews the perspective a little bit. And we just say, well, that one person is the person who's called. And I definitely do feel a sense of calling about being pastor and a sense of leading about leading New Horizons. However, long before I was called or felt led to be pastor of New Horizons, I felt called to be a minister in his kingdom, to be empowered and authorized to bring his kingdom. So this is true for all of us. We need to recognize uh, our calling to bring the kingdom. And this is for every follower of Jesus. Secondly, we need to do what Jesus did and say what Jesus said. How did the disciples, this is the million dollar question, right? How in the world did the disciples know what to do? They didn't go to Bible college. Uh, they had only followed Jesus for a little while. Um, you know, they weren't vocational ministers and, and by trade. Uh, we know that there was a tax collector, a fisherman. And so we have these different people who had different vocations before they came to Jesus. How did they know what to do? Because they were skilled in the ways of healing and ministry. And that's why Jesus called them because they already had these skills. No, <laughs> If you've followed, if you've read in the scriptures, you know, and I know, they weren't skilled in these things. They knew what to do because they mimicked what they heard and saw out of Jesus. They followed their rabbi, they followed Jesus, and they listened to what he taught, and they observed what he did in preaching about the kingdom of God. They saw how he delivered people from unclean spirits. And so then when it came time, when Jesus said to them, now you go, I authorize you to deliver people, to preach the message of the kingdom and deliver people from these unclean spirits, they knew exactly what it was he was talking about. The same is true for us. We need to do what Jesus did and say what Jesus said. We need to, it's, it's not as complicated as we make it out to be. Oftentimes, the complications that we put around this idea of ministry I find that in myself, sometimes I will complicate something to the point where I excuse myself from being responsible for it. Case in point, how many men have you heard say, well, I just don't know how to do the dishes. Here, let me give it a try. And they mess it up so wonderfully that the other person in the house will say, if they're, they're married, the spouse will say, don't ever do the dishes again. You're not any good about it, good with it. Or cooking. They'll mess up a meal so great, so horribly, that they'll never be asked to cook again. And in many ways, some guys take this approach, and I've heard them say this. They'll say, well, I got out of that one. I was so bad at it, they'll never ask me to do it again. While they're capable and they could learn it, it's easier if they just don't really try it all and they say, I'm just not qualified. Do you know that I think that happens more often than we care to admit in the kingdom of God? Oftentimes, I can find myself excusing myself that I should be doing something within the kingdom, whether it's sharing the gospel with somebody, praying for somebody for healing, uh, sharing a word, a prophetic word or encouraging word with somebody, because I tend to say, well, that's not really my gifting, or I don't really feel qualified for that. And I don't think it's just something I've struggled with. I've heard it a number of times within the body of Christ. We make it more complicated than it really is because in some ways we feel like it gets us off the hook from having to do it. But can I tell you, can I encourage you, can I employ you, implore with you to do what Jesus did and just say what he said and you'll be a minister in line with what Jesus has called you to be and to do and to say. It's really more simple than we oftentimes make it out to be. Now, this question comes up as well. What if it doesn't work the same for me? I read in the scriptures how it worked for the disciples. What if I pray for somebody and they're not healed? What if I try to witness or share my faith with somebody and it just doesn't come out that good? Keep trying. <laughs> try it and try it again. Do it and do it again. Keep praying, keep speaking, keep learning from the master of your faith. Keep observing in the scriptures how Jesus did it, saying the things that Jesus said, learning what it looks like to bring the kingdom of God to the people that God allows you to influence with the kingdom. We oftentimes 
don't just try something and become masters and very good at it. We have to keep doing it. And the same is true about ministry and bringing the kingdom of God. It's not just trying prayer once, but it's continuing to praying, pressing in on prayer, continue to pray for healing, continue to bring messages of deliverance for people who need to hear the good news. I am convinced that when you and I are persistent in this, we experience the kingdom in dynamic ways that we would never see if we just try it once and then say, well, I guess it's not for me. If you've ever felt like a failure in the kingdom of God, join the rest of us. <laughs> that, that is the natural way in which you grow in your discipleship is that you try something and you fail or you don't see the results you want, but what do you do? What do I need to do? Get in and try it again. Get in and pray again. Get in and ask God for an answer and get in and speak again the good news message of the kingdom of God. I'll wrap up with this. Two questions I always like to do this in our time together is to bring a couple points of reflection. I'm convinced that the Holy Spirit's already been speaking to you. I know he has been to me through these words. And so I know the Holy Spirit's already been speaking to you, but let me bring a couple thoughts for your consideration. Are you bringing the kingdom of God to the world around you or have you excused yourself from that being part of your responsibility? Are you bringing the kingdom of God to the world around you? Are you alleviating suffering with your words and the power of God? Just as Jesus called and released, empowered the disciples, the 12, so he has called you and empowered you to alleviate suffering through your words and through the power of God. That's why Jesus said he came, to bring the kingdom wherever he went. And that's why he commissions us. He calls us and releases us to bring the kingdom of God, the very same message. That's, that should be freeing to you. That should be freeing to me. You don't have to come up with the message. It's already given to you. You don't have to come up with ways to bring the kingdom. You just need to look at the life of Jesus and say what he said. Do what he did. And you're automatically bringing the kingdom of God to those around you. You have a good news message that can come to others. But the question is, have you kind of wiped your hands of it and said, well, I'm just not that good of it. I guess I can be excused from it. Or are you continuing to bring the kingdom even after you fail in an area to say, you know what? I'm gonna keep doing it because he's called me to it. Secondly, are you focused on his calling and his authority? Or have you been focused on your own worthiness? Because the truth is, you and I will never be worthy enough and we will never feel ready enough. If you and I were to feel worthy and ready in our own merit and in our own gifting and our own righteousness, we wouldn't need Jesus. <laughs> we, we wouldn't need his calling. We wouldn't need his empowering. We wouldn't even need his forgiveness because, well, we would have it on our own. And I think that's the point. I think that's what I really want to encourage you with is that when Jesus calls you, it's not because you're worthy. When he empowers you, it's not because you're at the spiritual level of maturity that he can't help but now empower you. No, just like the 12, he is ready to call you and empower you right where you're at. He's not waiting another month or another year or five years. Today is the day where he is calling you and empowering you to be a messenger in his kingdom. So the encouragement I would bring to you is it really comes back to my willingness, your willingness to be ministers, to be priests in his kingdom and be, receive this calling and this empowering. One last thing I want to highlight is that if you've never made the commitment to follow Jesus, if you're watching this and you're thinking, wow, this is, this is something that I've never considered as being part and, and the idea that God has brought his kingdom and that I could be a messenger for his kingdom. If you've never made a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, I wanna encourage you that today is the day for that. Now, you may say, you know, uh, I, I, I might do it, but maybe another day. Do you know that scripture encourages us is to not look ahead to tomorrow and assume that everything is going to be the way that we think it's going to be? I'm not into scare tactics, but if you've never accepted Christ, your tomorrow is not guaranteed. It's not guaranteed for your life that you will have another day, 
But I think even more so, I want to encourage you, it's not guaranteed that you're going to feel the draw of the Holy Spirit like you are today. If the Holy Spirit is drawing you to himself and he's calling you to respond in a commitment to follow Jesus Christ, then scripture teaches that today is the day of your salvation. Today is the day to respond. Don't put it off another day. To receive Jesus Christ, today is the day where you just say, Lord, I want your way over my way. I want to follow you and be a disciple of yours more than I want to live life on my terms. I trust your word over my word. I am ready to follow you wherever you may lead and do whatever you may say. That's really what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. Lord, forgive me for choosing myself over you. Wash me clean of my decisions, my disobedience to you, and help me become a follower of you as I give my life to you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit that I can be a disciple and follow you from this point going forward. If you make that decision in just a moment as this service wraps up, uh, there is a uh, invitation for you to receive this booklet. It's called Following Jesus. And uh, you can get it simply by emailing us, reaching out and contacting us. We'll pass it along to you at no cost. But that is the first and most important step in you beginning a journey with Jesus Christ. If you've already accepted Christ and you know him, then let me just reinforce this message. You are called and you are, you are empowered by him to bring the message of the kingdom of God. May you and I both follow through with it and live it out. I wanna pray for you, I wanna pray for myself as we do it. Lord, we thank you that you made this gospel, you made this calling and this empowering very simple, that it doesn't take a PhD, it doesn't take a Bible college degree, and it, it doesn't take a special kind of person, it simply takes a willing person who is going to be obedient. And so Lord, we today in hearing this, we raise our hand and we say, yes, Lord, I want to be a priest in your kingdom. I want to be a minister and deliver the message of the kingdom empowered by your Holy Spirit to set people free. Lord, we don't disqualify ourselves. In fact, we say, yes, we recognize our unworthiness, but we also recognize that Jesus Christ, you are worthy and you are the one who has called us. So we say yes and amen to your calling and to your empowering, and we commit ourselves to going forward with the good news that the kingdom of God has come and deliverance has come for those who have been held in captivity. We are committed to praying for people, even when we don't see the results, to keep praying. We are committing to set people free from the demonic and dark forces of this world, even if we don't see the immediate results, to see people healed and set free in Jesus' name. We're going to keep at it because we believe in what you have said and what you have done, and we're going to do the same. We pray it and we believe it in Jesus' name, amen. The Lord bless you and may you be ambassadors, priests, ministers in his kingdom this week and in the coming months. You can find more resources for this service at nhgj.org. Email us your prayer requests to prayer at nh4gj.org. If you are a new follower of Jesus, we have a free resource for you called Following Jesus. To receive a copy, send a request to info at nh4gj.org. If you would like to partner with our ministry through giving, you can do that online at nhgj.org giving or by mail to 641 Horizon Drive, Grand Junction, Colorado, 81506. Thank you for being with us and may the Lord bless you.